Hello and welcome. This is episode number two for Sold Cloak. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, We are going to get started here in a quick word of prayer, uh, just by uh, way of notice. It's uh, myself, Ethan. Uh, We have Jack. We have Dan. Uh, Like last time, we also have Mark with us. Um, So without further ado, let's get started. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for this day, and I just pray that you would be here with us and give us understanding as men in our society to know how to lead our families, how to how to just uh, be good examples in the society, and I pray that you give us good, strong convictions and give, give us wisdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. All righty. So we're going to be talking today about how to handle different social collapse, whether it be you know economic or political or, or whatever, um, how to handle it, you know, personally maybe uh, advice that we can give or just talking back and forth and and getting an idea of the the kinds of situations we might face and the best ways to address those. But before we get into that, we are going to read a little bit in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, Last time we read the little preamble, so this time we're going to read Article 1, Section 1. It's nice and short, nice and easy. So here we go. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. Short and sweet. Wouldn't that be nice? Mm, all legislative oh, powers. Man. Wait, you mean the, wait, the president's not allowed to legislate? Uh-huh. You yeah. mean like by executive order? I thought that was legislation. Are you serious? We can't. That's, that's passing legislation. Uh, is well, executive order in here? No, but Roe v. Wade was okay, though. That was, that was proper legislation, right? Yeah, that was legislation. That was legislation right. from the court. From the court. It doesn't say that here. All legislative powers here in Greenland shall be vested in Congress of yeah. the United States, which I consider the Senate House of Representatives. We might, we might have messed that one up. We yeah. might mess it. We did the pre- preamble, okay, but There's, now that we're actually into it, I think we messed something up. So yeah. it's not just the Bill of Rights that's destroyed, but yeah. even the first article. Yeah, we, have, we haven't gotten that. One is just obliterated. We haven't yeah. gotten that far I mean, yet. So. Wow. I mean, we're, we, we've got legislation, according to some people in Congress, uh, new legislation has been passed by the ATF. Oh, wait, hold on. Let me read it again. Oh, wait. All legislative powers here in uh, Congress, uh, Senate, how, they're not in here. Yeah, they said the new the new le- legislation from the ATF. That was the wording hmm. of one of the uh, Congress people's when they were talking about They obviously about have not the, read their constitution in a long time. The, yeah, it's, hmm. uh, it's really amazing. Maybe someone someone should let them know, like call them. Maybe, and maybe especially an organization that is headquartered in Puerto Rico and does not even have jurisdiction in. Is that where the ATF is? Oh yeah, huh. mm-hmm. interesting. Very interesting. Well, anywho's so uh, <laughs> topic today is is dealing with collapse, and uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna gotta uh, get us started a little bit on some of my thoughts uh, that I was writing down the other day. So the way I see it is collapse can be split into the three main categories uh, in in order of severity. So the first category would be a market collapse, like how we saw with the Great Depression. And um, I'll just read what I've written down here. This is the least destructive of the three. A large increase in unemployment and poverty as the national or global market fails. This leads to the need for more self-sufficiency as the reliable sources of support disappear or shrink dramatically. Mm. This can be a transitional phase as the market recovers or is reestablished. Uh, number two, soft political collapse. Uh, as And as an example, the Soviet Union, uh, this is more destructive than a market collapse. A political collapse can cause the market collapse as a side effect. Additionally, there is confusion and a potential power vacuum, often leading to armed conflict and possibly famines. If the state can maintain some control or a revolutionary state, neighboring state, invading state, or primary constituent state, can replace the original, social order can be maintained. During the transitional phase, individuals and families may have to fend for themselves. And then the third, hard collapse, and as an example, that would be the Dark Ages after the collapse of Rome. This is similar to the soft political collapse, except the original state fails to regain control, and no other state, constituent, neighbor, or invading, is able to satisfactorily maintain order. This is often due to an entire region collapsing simultaneously, not just the one state. This is full social collapse, and it requires society to be reconstructed from the ground up. Oftentimes, there is regular local armed conflict between rival warlord kingdoms and the potential for widespread, unmitigated famines, pestilences, plagues during this time. Some educational, technological, and medical advancements are lost, and individuals, families, and communities are entirely left to their own devices for sustenance. 
So that's kind of how I, I break it down in understanding collapse. And so I don't know if y'all have any thoughts, interjections, opinions on that. I know y'all want to get into the nitty gritty details. So, yeah, I would say, you know, that is, that is a pretty good overview of it. And, um, some people would think of some collapses as being underneath an authoritarian government, you know, um, they would consider that a collapse, but that's a that's an oppression. That's a different. Yeah, you different have category. order. Yeah, you just right. it's not good for you order, but yeah, right. and and you may have poor order, like what you tend to have after the third with the with the full collapse. You'll have some kingdoms come up, like with the 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 Dark Ages. There were those German Germanic tribes that came in and set up kingdoms, but they weren't well established. They weren't very well run, and they were usually kind of temporary. And you know, it, you still kind of just perpetually have to fend for yourself a little bit, even though there's some order, it's not total chaos, you know? Right. Yeah. And you, and you, and there's people that live in third world countries that right now have to, you know, fend for themselves a decent amount because just, it's not reliable, the order that's there. And it's been that way for a long time, but right. yeah, not exactly collapse. I wouldn't say. Right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I just wanted to put that in there. And in my personal opinion, I think that we're well within a recession right now and we're steadily, and quickly on our way towards that Great Depression, that first market collapse. Um, and there's no there's no signs that we wouldn't have a, a political one in the future. And um, and of course, we are the U.S., so and we're very connected with the rest of the world when it comes to political stuff and market stuff. I mean, whenever we had our Great Depression, the whole world had the Great Depression. It was, it was all over. I think Australia had it worse than we did. Um, so if our market collapses, if our... Uh, political power system, which oftentimes is, is, you know, propping up other stuff. If that collapses, maybe it would lend towards a full complete collapse, but I don't know if it's too early right now to call. And I don't know if it's going to this time because so many other nations are preparing and making moves to not be dependent Mm -hmm. upon us where, you know, France is um, already trading in Chinese one, Brazil is making moves a lot of your south american countries are also doing that trying to get away from the dollar so that when we do fall hard it's not going to affect them near as severely yeah and that's obviously a wise thing for them to do i mean i I commend them for it even though they're technically our enemies um and also i think globally and it, it might sound kind of bad i think it's a good thing though because it's better that you have places like China and Russia having some level of, of order than the whole world be in some extreme chaotic dark ages, I think. But that's just kind of off the top of my head. I, don't, I haven't really given that way too much thought. But, you know, I mean, whenever you have a little bit of chaos in one localized region, it's not quite so bad because you got all the other regions, you know, around that can... There is some stability. You can leave that region and find stability. But whenever you have a huge region, like a full continent or even the whole globe in that level of chaos, I don't know, that just seems really bad. One of the things that I've been pondering lately is the scenario where you have collapse, but then you also have islands of stability. And I think that uh, if you look at Agenda 2030 and the 15-minute cities and the mega cities that they're trying to create, that what they're trying to do is maintain order in these mega cities, these 15-minute cities, Mm -hmm. and leave the rest of it to fend for itself. And who's they? That has always been the question. (laughs) The the elite, the ones that are making these uh, symposiums, the... uh, Davos Group, the World Economic Forum, the United Nations, Mm -hmm. the uh, globalist leaders that are getting together and that are really um, beating the drum for the 15-minute city ideas, the no fossil fuel ideas, the um, no farm ideas. I mean, all of the things that we're seeing in the news now Mm -hmm. and the poisoning of um, farmland, the taking away of that property that has been poisoned and then forcibly moving those citizens into their 15-minute city so that they can be taken care of. So, uh, But whatever stays outside of that is going to be fending for themselves, is, is what I'm seeing it go towards. And even to the point that I think the mark of the beast, if you will, 
uh, may play into that, that without the mark, you won't even be able to get into the city, much less be able to get into the store or purchase the merchandise. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Interesting. It's like almost like a, like a different class. Like there's the outside class that we don't we don't care for and take care of, and then there's like the there's the in group. I think almost. that's what they may be moving towards seeing because they're they're. It seems like everything that is happening is with intent, and that that is the intention is to move people out of the rural areas, put them all into the city so they can be controlled and manipulated. And of course, it's always being billed as you know this is for you. And then whatever's left out there is going to be illegal, is going to be outside the system, is not going to be able to participate and will be fending for themselves. So those that do not want to participate in that coming system, their environment will be collapsed, even though they may see a system that is mm-hmm. not in collapse. Yeah, I mean, and any time you have collapse, there's always something that's not. I don't think there's ever been a, a global collapse since we've had, like, the flood. You know, whenever the uh, the Dark Ages were, were roaring in uh, in Europe, that was the Islamic Golden Age. You know, right. they, they had that great society. That's when they were doing their best. They had great science, education, education, great science, yeah. great cities, great <clears throat> universities. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you're, I don't think you're ever going to, well, the, the world is getting a lot more global now. I mean, you could have Europe fall into chaos and the Middle East not, uh, whereas now everything's so interconnected. I don't know. I don't know what it would look like. We haven't had a, a full on dark ages in any region for a while. I don't, I don't think, you know, so to, I don't, I don't know what it would look like. It could be unpredictable. Yeah. So if America does collapse, yeah, and you're saying China and them continue to do good, <clears throat> how does that help us? It just means that there there is order in the world. There is products being made somewhere. Now it may be hard for us to get stuff or whatever, but it there's there's something to work around in a way, you know. And and people, if they wanted to leave a chaotic system, <clears throat> if they could get on like a, a boat or something and, and get to a better place. I mean, you had you had Europeans, I'm sure, that lived in um, you know the the Arabic world at the time because <clears throat> it was a better place to live at the time, or or that's you know they wanted to have a, a a good job or something, you know. But if the whole world is totally collapsed, there is no stability to find anywhere. You know, there's no products being made necessarily you know so let's say china and north korea is left do you see do you see them letting us in if we're on a boat and go over there i mean when people grovel people yeah i mean pe- people like groveling people slaves <laughs> yeah oh yeah i mean that's, that's, that's power okay. that's that's the best if you're <clears throat> if you're a power hungry person the best thing you can see is somebody groveling at your feet that's the best thing so yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll take us in. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's, but not always. There have been no. there have been uh, liberals who wanted to be expatriates mm-hmm. and tried to go to Russia or China, and they were rejected. China was like, "We don't, we don't need your kind. No, mm-hmm. you're yeah. not welcome here. Go away." Yeah, yeah, but it wasn't like masses of people that are willing to be right. You know, slave labor. You know, one millennial person that they got their feelings hurt about political stuff isn't going to do them any good, you know, but to have, yeah, a whole, a whole force of people, I think, you know, that'd be good. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you see things like the intentional, what it seems to be an intentional uh, failure of America when when it comes to things like Afghanistan, the withdrawal there, and just the way that we've been handling ourselves, we've, we've been losing power just really quickly. And, you know, it, do you, do you see that as, as intentional or as just... Absolutely intentional by yeah. design. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it like, does I, seem like, like I've been tell, like I've been telling you for years, um, the decline of our military has been intentional. Mm-hmm. Pe- people who are good soldiers that are that think ahead, make good decisions, good generals, good lieutenants are systematically weeded out on purpose. I watched it happen. And we've seen that since the Clinton eras. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There is a concerted effort to um, take away the effectiveness of the United States military. And I watched it happen from the inside. It was very, <laughs> very, very clear. People with the right politics and the low enough IQ kept getting promoted while the other guys got railroaded out. Well, it sounds like we're sending all of our ammunition to other people and all of our equipment. 
Yeah, like with Ukraine and yeah. everything. Yeah, I mean, and all you know, the equipment that was that. left behind in Afghanistan, yeah. including, mm-hmm. and then you've got all the equipment we've sent overseas. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not going to be much left for right. us to yeah. use. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I just saw today where there were, what was it, six nuclear powered Soviet submarines that were launched into the Pacific? I heard uh, a rumor that there was going to be, but I didn't know I that it happened. Here, I saw yeah. that it happened today or okay. yesterday. Mm. Well, isn't that something? It's so. something. Um, also, I mean, just on that vein real quick, um, the military has uh, relaxed its um, acceptance of the, the BMI, body mass index. I saw that. Up to, I believe it's, um, they moved, for men it's 26%, and then for women I think it's 35%, which, um, yeah, so I, I could pass... They've lowered the, all the standards. In the condition that I'm in right now with the new, because they have a new PT test. Right. I did it recently just to see. I'm I'm all, I'm all busted up. I'm out of shape. I'm fat. And yeah. I I could easily. Fat Jack. Fat <laughs> Jack. Yep. I could easily. I, I easily passed uh, the requirements for right. my age group. Well, they're absolutely desperate because so many yeah. of the military <laughs> aged draftable young men and women within the nation are ineligible to serve. Right. And many of them even under the lax standards because of drug abuse, alcohol abuse, uh, prescription medications, mental issues, obesity. There's we're we're toast. Oh yeah. Yeah, and on a on a similar vein, I was watching a uh, a video from a uh he's a guy that studies military history, modern military history and everything. And he was given a, a talk at a like a military academy, I believe, and he was saying how in our recent modern time, since, you know, the war in Iraq and all that sort of stuff, uh, that we've just had a lot worse leadership. Um, and he, he's saying that there, there was a change that was made from like the World War II era stuff to mm-hmm. modern stuff was uh, back then, if, if a general wasn't on his A game at that moment, he wasn't calling really good shots and getting really good success, then he's fired. He doesn't have to fail to be fired. He just doesn't have, if he's not absolutely the best he's fired and you replace him with somebody that is on their a game and it's not that he's gone forever or that he's a bad guy just okay go deal Mm -hmm. with your stuff if you're you got issues with your wife or whatever go home get that stuff sorted out get back on your a game we'll we'll get you into a lower position and then build you back up and you'll be a general again in no time and you know that way they always had really top-notch uh management and uh whereas since uh the like the nineties and, and all the invasions and whatnot, we just keep the generals no matter if they're doing well or poorly. We just, we just keep them on. Cause it's, we don't, you know, we don't want to fire people. That's like a, a negative thing or something. So you got people that really, their head's not in it. They're, they don't have good ideas. They're not handling stuff well. And they just stay in charge for years, you know? And, um, they behave like middle man- managers. Yeah. Yeah. Our general, well, and all of the generals that had any, um, gumption and could talk up to, you know, and, and question orders you know which is a general your jo- your job at that point is to question orders and say hey what's the plan you you are big picture well the only people above right. you are politicians that don't right. know war yeah, so and your it, job is to filter yeah. that and be like okay whoa hold up you know this is going to cost a lot of lives wow dan is leaving us no that's sad yeah sorry oh, prior engagements started late you're engaged? Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. And, and married. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Well, we understand. We appreciate you, man. Appreciate yeah, y'all. Later. Thank you. And I will well. look forward to listening to this. Yeah. 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 Hopefully yeah. it'll be good. So, but, um, yeah, during, while I was in, um, there was a purge of generals. And um, you can look it up. But uh, under Obama, they they fired, it was three quarters of all of the generals on all of the branches mm. and it was all of the people who had the chutzpah to make decisions. They fired all the Jewish generals. Yeah. Oh, wow. Huh. That's yeah. rough. But uh, no, that was, yeah, that's what they did. I mean, they just went through and, and got rid of anybody who thought critically essentially. Yeah. And, uh, yes, well, it, it has been very bad decisions ever since. If I'm not mistaken, I mean, when COVID came about, you could get out if you don't want to take the shot, right? Uh, no, the, you actually, <laughs> very interesting thing happened. 
they said you had to, or you would be um, discharged. Discharged. So to me, that means if you don't want to take it, you stand up. They don't want you standing up, so they got rid of you. Well, that was the plan. Yeah. Um, but so many people did that that the they whole couldn't. and it was all the people that had the the best productivity. Um, like someone that I'm related to uh, refused. Um, he's in the Air Force, and um, you know, fully expecting to to yeah. lose his job. Um, you know, dishonorable discharge, threatened with, you know, legal proceedings, all sorts of stuff. Um, and then every day they kept saying, you know, you got to change your mind or next week is the, it's the chopping block. Next week comes along, you got to change your mind or next week's the chopping block. He's still there. <laughs> they, uh, they back down on it. Um, and Do I, you I, feel that's because so many stood up not to take it? Yeah. Okay. It was, it was. I'm sure it still had an effect because you have you have a lot of people that are like, well, you either would take it or would say, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, you know, deal with this, and they they try to get out maybe in other ways or, or look for other yeah. things, you know. That and, definitely happened. Yeah, but a lot of people took it, and also, I mean, when you say you won't, and then someone forces you to, that changes you. You're not the same person anymore. You've mm-hmm. lost something. Yeah. And that happened to a lot of people. And yeah. I've seen, you know, I've seen, I've talked to people in the military and there's a lot of people who are just beat down mm-hmm. that used to have that fire. And that was the last straw for them. So like, I'm not going to take it. And then they're like, well, you're going to, not only are you going to lose your job, but you're going to get a dishonorable discharge. You're going to get a, you know, article 15, you're going to get, mm-hmm. you know, and you're not going to be able to get a job in the civilian world. And you've got kids and these people, you like, you know what? Okay. And they caved mm-hmm. and then. Yeah, that's that's a psychological thing. I mean, that's oh. that's what people do with animals. That we had we have to break them, you know. Right. And then after you break them, you don't have to break a horse three or you know. You once it's broken, it's broken, and you're yeah. you're done, you know. And when it comes to to all that sort of thing, once you get that that psychological advantage over something right. and it submits and it yields, well, then you know that's you that's the hard it. part. Yeah, it's easier. Break it, it follows. Yeah, yeah, yep. And that, every <clears> time it's easier. Yeah, and that can affect the other person from from then on out, you know. And yeah. I think they can undo it. Of course, humans are a lot more intelligent and self willed than animals are, but it's going to take. It you almost need like an unbreaking. You need a, you need a, an intentional time of going against that thing because it's like a switch got flipped off and you got to flip it back on. It doesn't just slowly happen over time, you right? Know? Yeah, there has to be a a, a decision made, mm-hmm. and then a a. It, it, I've I haven't seen people do it though. I, it can be done, but I don't know anybody mm-hmm. personally yeah. that has gotten crushed and then stood back up. I'm Spartacus. Right. It's a, yeah, it's a, it, it's a, it seems like mostly a one way valve. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now, of course, right now we haven't yet seen a whole bunch of negative repercussions for going along with the system and, 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 you know, following the, the, I don't want to say government because that, that sounds a little too lofty. Like the like the middle management kind of stuff. I'll, yeah, like like we were just talking about with the with the Constitution. You know, laws are made by Congress, and yet we have these weird things like you know COVID mandates coming from the president. You're like, what is what is this? What kind of you know? But right, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think we've seen enough negativity from it. I mean, we don't see people starving in the streets. You know, we don't see people being killed publicly or, or visibly or something, you know, but I think, I think if mm-hmm. things got a lot worse, people would have that I'm Spartacus moment and they would, you know, I hope so. <laughs> well, here's the thing. It's, you know, and this is something that a lot of people have talked about. A lot of psychologists, you, you go that when you, if you want to change someone, if you want to force someone to follow your will, what you do is you push on them until right before they say no, and then you just stop right there and you wait and they get used to that. And then you push again until they are about to say no. You wait. You don't do it mm-hmm. before they say no. So what it is is you you expand the overreach mm-hmm. until 5% of people stand up and they have their moment. Now, every time you stand up, you're more likely to do it again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that changes a, something inside a, of you that, too. That changes something yeah. inside of you. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be four times as hard to crush that person. Mm-hmm. So, but it, what you do is you just push until 5% and then you wait, you stay right there where you are. 5% isn't enough to, to push back the, the momentum, right? It stays where it's right there. You wait three years. Everybody calms down. Even the people who stood up, 
well, this is the new normal. I stopped it. I stopped here. I didn't let it go any further. Mm-hmm. But you get comfortable there. And then they push, they push again, they yep. push again until, <clears throat> until those 5% stand up again. And then they stop. Mm-hmm. And then they wait. And they go further and further. Mm-hmm. And now it's harder to stop you. It's harder to stand up. More people have just gotten used to being under oppression. Mm-hmm. And there's less and less and less likeliness. Yeah, and you'll have you'll have a, a small minority of people that are that are strongly standing up against you, and they regularly do it. But yeah, you know, you have a lot of people that maybe have never done it once, mm-hmm. you know. And now now it's really far down the road, and your first opportunity is going to be something that's really difficult, like way yeah. harder than than oh, you might lose this particular job. Oh no, right. You know? <laughs> See, there's other jobs, at least right now, you know, right. where there may come a time that you could lose a lot more and it's a lot harder to stand mm-hmm. up for the first time in a situation like that. Yeah. I think that could, that could definitely be a, a, an issue. And it, it, it definitely <clears throat> could be. And, and is, I mean, and we've seen it happen and, and that's another thing. I mean, I missed a little bit. I had to step out for a second. So I, I know he was, he mentioned the 15 minute cities and mm-hmm. those, those things. I don't know how much of a detail he went into. Um, uh, he, he was given his, his, what is the uh, definition of a 15 minute city? I had to ask him that like yesterday or the day before. Uh, so the idea is that, you know, you're in this little area of, of the city and everything that is required for your life is within 15 minutes of you and you can walk and you can go and get it. Uh, you don't have a car. You don't, it's you don't need to leave and also you kind of really can't leave so they can they can contain you you do your little life and almost like you're like a like a pet in a box or something you know you, you all your, your stuff is right here and um so people aren't upwardly mobile they're not just traveling around seeing the rest of the world so you can control people a lot better if they're just stuck in their one little area and they're totally dependent on you too you know so they can't just leave and go find another place this is home, these 15 minutes, this, this little area that I'm in, you know, and you can just kind of copy and paste that little style and just have a, a huge city, you know, with a lot of people that right. they don't even interact all with each other, just the people in their little 15 minutes, you know, so. Yeah. yeah. And that's, yeah, because it, when you have a car and I've seen, I mean, you've seen this with people who don't have never had a car, mm-hmm. they've never driven anywhere. Uh, they're the thought process in you and you, it's just different. Mm-hmm. You, the world feels different. Yeah. The world gets a lot more stretched out. It's almost like you live in a, a desert, you know, you're, you're in a little oasis and if you just keep walking, you'll just die in the desert. You can't <laughs> just leave, you know? Uh, right. Yeah. Whereas when you're, when you're in a car, just the whole world shrinks in front of you. You could just, you're a hop, skip and a jump from anywhere, you know, you just yeah. put some gas in that tank and you're good to go. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And yeah. And there's that, you know, that's the idea of, okay, fine. You know, this state has pushed it too far. I'm loading up the truck. I'm going to, I'm leaving. Yeah. And people have been doing that since, you know, 2020 in mass. I mean, right. it happened before. It was a trickle before, but 2020 was the flood and people are leaving places yeah. that just are going the wrong direction, but they can leave. There's, right. there's no rules against it. We're allowed to have interstate travel. Nobody's allowed to stop you. Yeah, you got your car or whatever. Mm-hmm. There's lots of reliable transportation methods. You know, you you go buy a plane ticket, whatever you need to do, and yeah. you can get somewhere. But you know, I watched a lot of, um, I watched some videos of people from New York City. You know, people just man on the street interviews, and they're talking to somebody who is homeless, and um, he's like, "Hey, you know, how'd you get homeless?" It's like, "Oh, with the lockdowns, I had a business, and you know, it failed." And then I got a job and then I lost my job and then I couldn't afford rent. So now I'm homeless, you know, recently homeless. And people are like, why didn't, why don't you just leave? Like go work at McDonald's and get an apartment in upstate New York. Like, why didn't you just do that? Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, I've never left New York city in my life. Yeah. And I was like, is it how scary is it to think about leaving? He's like, oh, it was terrifying. Like I've never been outside of, the city. Well, it's, like, it's almost like saying we have. Uh, hey, hey, Mark, you have to move to Spain to keep surviving. Yeah. It's like wh- what? What? Like yeah. that's, that's don't, don't have a clue. Yeah. How how right. do I even get there? Like, it, am I legally allowed to just walk in? Like, do I need papers? What you know? Yeah. What kind of jobs do they have available there? Like, yeah, just it totally foreign. You know, so the and that's even right. staying in the same state, just going <laughs> going out of the city, right. going upstate. But they didn't you know? have a vehicle <clears throat> and. Yeah. You know, there were, public transportation wasn't leaving the city because of COVID. And, mm-hmm. you know, and so, yeah, this person is 
literally homeless. And being homeless on the streets was less scary mm. than going into the wider world because he had never been out there. Yeah, that's almost like an accidental 15-minute city. Right. You know, without even design. It just no happened. design, it just happened. Um, yeah. I talked to an old man um, back in um, 2009, no, 2010 in New York City. Um, my wife and I went to go watch the, the Bull Rodeo in uh, Madison Square Garden. Mm -hmm. And there was a guy eating sandwiches out of the garbage can. And so I went and I bought him a sandwich and I sat there and talked to him for a while. And it was the same thing. And that was with no pandemic and no nothing. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, why, why are you here? Why are you in a bus station eating sandwiches out of the trash? I was like, there's places where you could survive without doing that. Mm -hmm. And um, he was 60 something years old. They said, I, I've never left this borough. Yeah. This is my whole life. And he's like, and once you get used to that life, it's, it's just. He's like, I can't do it. I can't leave. I can't. He's like, I thought about getting on that bus every day. He's like, I can't do it. Mm. It's too scary. Man. Yeah. And people. Trapped. And people don't have like, um, you know, their, their, their close family or friends. A lot of people don't have very close friends and stuff. Mm -hmm. People that, you know, maybe two people are both scared. They're like, all right, we're going to go together. <laughs> you know, we're going to, we're going to be scared on, you know, in the middle yep. of nowhere and. We can help each other survive or something, you yeah. know. But he uh, he said he had a wife and a daughter, um, and his wife passed away, and his um, his daughter moved, and he lost contact. Doesn't know where she lives or her phone number, and he's homeless, so she doesn't know where he's at. Mm -hmm. And so he said that was all the the all the friends and family he had. Yeah. So there's no there's no human contact. For all she knows, he's dead. Of course, by now probably he is. Yeah. But. Yeah, that because we we lived in the country. Mm -hmm. What do you mean you haven't been ten minute drive? Yeah, we had, like you had to go ten minutes just to go to Walmart. <laughs> I, like, I can't. I just got on a bus. No, I got on a train. You know, to come here to watch some bull riding. I was like, "Have you ever been to Madison Square Garden?" I like, I've never been that far. I'm thinking, two, I was two hours away. Yeah, and we just decided, hey, it's fun. We got free tickets from the military. We're gonna go, mm -hmm. and. Like you can you can walk through this man's whole world, in in fifteen minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that I didn't think that that actually existed until that moment talking to that man, and yeah. that that I I had to adjust in my head what people do. Mm -hmm. You know the model of humanity that I had. Yeah, yeah, and of course you're gonna get a lot of different results with different different people and different psyches and whatnot. So back to the whole how to handle collapse. And we were talking about the different types of collapses we might see, the direction we think our our country's currently going and everything. But um, <clears throat> the way I kind of understand it is you kind of have to know about how emergent your collapse is. How soon is this going to happen? And that heavily affects your plan. I mean, obviously, if, if you've got, you know, bands of roving, you know, bandits that are coming at you right now, like that's going to, that requires a particular response. <clears throat> There's a response for, oh no, we might have a social conflict or, or, or armed conflict, like a, like a civil war or something like that in the next year or two. Well, that has its own set of you know, response. Or we have a, well, it looks like, you know, our, our economic system's not going to be reliable for the next, you know, it, we don't know when it'll collapse, but it may be, it may last a couple of decades. We need to be ready to just to, to survive it out, you know, and, you know, I think I think all those different things required a different solutions, different plans, and everything. I mean, I know with like with 2020, there was a lot of a lot of guns and ammunition that were purchased. You know, and, and people uh, getting ready for who knows what. You know, they don't they don't know what's coming, and that seemed to be the responsible sort of thing to do. It, maybe it's immediate, and if it's immediate, you need to be able to defend yourself and your family. You know, and then I think where we're at now, you know, we, we see that, okay, so we, we didn't immediately fall into to a civil war or something. Not that that's not on the table, but... At least you're ready for it. Yeah, now at least you still got your, your guns <laughs> yes. and ammunition and everything. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it, it's looking... We're, we're noticing things like, uh, you know, of course, prices across the board are rising. We got inflation just going and increasing everything. And then you, you'll see specifically, you know, this particular product will... will go way, way out of its bounds for price, just, you know, on its own. And then another one will, and then another, another one will. And, you know, it's, it's, it looks pretty obvious that it's just going to get worse. You know, we had, 
we had a, a very severe response to, to COVID in 2020. And we, we, our government made some decisions that are going to last for decades, you know, maybe longer. And uh, they didn't have immediate uh, effect. But you don't just give people checks for multiple thousands of dollars to everybody. Like, you don't just do that and nothing happens. There's going to be, you know, uh, effects that that, that that causes. And um, so I think now people are looking more into a long-term thing. People are buying chickens and learning how to... to People that don't like that kind of stuff and that don't want to do that kind of stuff are looking into, okay, so how do you milk a goat? <laughs> you know, people that yeah. never thought they'd ask themselves that question. And, you know, people are starting small and they're getting small, you know, animals and that kind of stuff. People are growing gardens, people that don't have a green thumb and don't enjoy growing gardens, you know. And um, so I think people are already kind of doing it, doing it. They're trying to respond to whatever threat they believe is, is coming towards them. But uh, what kind of threats do y'all think that we're... Uh, we should be preparing for. Um, I've, I think there's a, there's a checklist that you should behave in a manner of, of which thing you do thing, a thing, B thing, C. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that checklist is the same list dependent on whichever collapse it is. And the only thing is how far into that list can you get <laughs> Right. Yeah. Let's say let's say that the the collapse is going to be next week, and you've got you know somebody called you up and they work for you know NSA and they're like, hey guys, everything's collapsing. The banks are over. There is no anything. What's mm -hmm. on the shelves is that's all there is, and we're piecing out to Cancun, and we've got like you know underground shelters, and y'all are you know I'm just giving you a week's notice, right? Yeah. In that scenario. If you don't already have firearms, body armor, those basic ways to defend the things that you do have, mm -hmm. then that's the first thing you do. You need to acquire yeah. a firearm, you need to acquire ammunition, and you need to acquire some body armor, mm -hmm. a way to keep what you have and to get more if necessary, mm -hmm. right? You got a week, that's all you can do. And, and, to, and to make it to where when you are getting more on your own, people aren't going to come by and right. take it while you're working on it. You know? Right. And so, because if you don't have that, then you're just resources for somebody who does. Yeah. Yeah. If there's no rule of law, <clears throat> an, an evil person mm -hmm. will arise. Yeah. And they will come and take your beans out of your cabinet. Because you, you can hope that, that people are nice and lots of people are nice, <laughs> but you know. Not eventually there's going to be yeah. someone that's not you know one person there will be somebody who's hungry who has yeah. a gun and who will take your stuff mm -hmm. if you do not that's just the way that it is yeah so if you know there's an immediate collapse the first thing you do is you get armed right mm -hmm. it's like okay well what happens if somebody calls and tells you there's going to be a collapse in a year well if you don't have a firearm the first thing you do <laughs> is you grab your fire get a firearm yeah you get it and now you have time to get some training mm -hmm. so now you have a firearm you have ammunition, body armor, all the equipment you need, and then you practice with it some. Yeah. And then if you still have time, you do things like get a water filter, a way to purify drinking water. Mm -hmm. You get water storage. Then you can get food storage. And depending on how much time you have and how much resources you have available to you, that might be all you can do. Mm -hmm. like, okay, well, you're more prepared than you were before you knew. Right. Well, then somebody says, hey, you got two years. It's like, okay, now you're into the position where I'm going to get a firearm, <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm going to get some, you know, a little bit of food storage. I'm going to get a little bit of water storage. I'm going to get some purification tablets or my, you know, mm -hmm. filters. And then if you still got time, you say, okay, can I move to a better place? If so, I'm in the middle of a city, yeah. well, I should probably get out of the middle of a city. Yeah, because if you got three years, I mean, you can you can move, get a new job, get established, have a place to live, meet know, the community, yeah, all that stuff before it all happens. You don't want to be a refugee, you know, getting right. off of a train with <laughs> a bag, and right. you know. but if all you have is a week, yeah. well, then you get a go bag, yeah, and yeah. you are that guy, and well, it sucks, but you only had a week, you did your best. So I think really what it is is just how much time do you have? I think the list of things that you do. Mm -hmm. is the same list. It's just how far can you, how much prepared can you get? 
Now, do you, do you think it, it changes any with the type of collapse? You're, that's talking about like the, the proximity, like how, how emergent is the collapse right. to us? And then, okay, this, this, we're going to go through a Great Depression. Like, if, of course, you don't always know what you're going to have, so you've got to prepare for the worst, I guess. That kind of maybe nullifies any sort of question. But, you know, if, if, you, don't, if you don't know, maybe it's just going to be a, a Great Depression, and we're going to get through this, but it's going to take a decade, and, you know, you got to fend for yourself yeah. in that decade. Or is it... Like Once. America's over and who knows who's going to replace us, but we're probably going to have something to replace us. <clears throat> or is it like, man, this is, this is dark ages. I mean, we're going to, we're going to be totally cut off from the rest of the world for the rest of my life right. and just, you know, living off the land. And, well, and I don't have a clue when it's going to start or nothing, but I feel that if you're not ready, you should start getting ready. Yeah. I mean, yeah. right now. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, just, I don't need someone to tell me you got a week, you got a year. I'm acting like it's tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And, and, and if it don't happen for 20 years, fine. Yeah, yeah. if guess, it does happen. Well, th- and that's the thing that I was going to say is, um, I, once again, I don't think it matters what the collapse is. I, right. think, I think the behavior should be the same because Get you can't guarantee that it's only going to be an economic collapse. Mm-hmm. You can't guarantee that it's only going to be a recession or, you know, there is no, there's no guarantee once you start down that path. And, and this is something that a lot of people have that don't, they don't realize the more people that get prepared, the more resilient society is, Mm -hmm. the less likely you are of having the collapse in the first place. Mm -hmm. Let's just say, I mean, for the sake of an argument, I mean, if 50% of people in a country saw that there might be economic trouble in 20 years, and so they became as self-sufficient as possible while still being engaged in the economy. Mm Mm-hmm still buying cars, still doing normal shopping trips to buy things that they need. Even if they could make it themselves, they've learned to, they have the supplies, but they, they want to keep society going. They don't want to shut it down, but they've got, they know how to grow food, know how to store food, have a year's supply on hand. You know, if 50% of the population falls into that category, let's say you do have a total governmental collapse. Well, you've got a year that these people, so even if they share their resources with the rest of the people who had no preparation at all, mm-hmm. you have six months of resources on hand. You're not going to be short a single thing. And you have the food production already set up to supply half of the needed um, resources to people already spun up. With the amount of time you've got on what's stored and the ability to spin up and how many people know how to do these things you could so easily reset society and it would be looked upon as a, Oh wow. That what that looked like a scary time in history, but boy, we sure got lucky. It's like, well, no, you didn't get lucky. You got prepared. prepared. Um, whereas that same collapse, if 5% of people were ready, it would have been a 10, 15 year, you know, millions of people starved to death collapse, Mm -hmm. but instead nobody starved to death. And in a year society was back up and running. Yeah, I think right. the I think the pushback on that for just why don't we always do that then is I think there's a spectrum when it comes to the division of labor. So you got on, on one mm-hmm. hand, we could we could go back to being, you know, tribal, you know, people, everybody living off the land. You take care of yourself, your tribe takes care of itself, and you don't go out very far. There is no Walmart that's you know, everybody knows how to tan hide, everybody knows how to how to butcher and what that, I mean, that, that that makes each person more resilient, yes, but it also makes it to where society as a whole really doesn't do much together because everybody's busy taking care of themselves. But the yeah. more civilized you become, um, and not in like a, a, a positive or negative sense of that term, just more city, that's what, you know, what it means, more city-based and more division of labor, you know, I don't, I don't take care of my car, I bring it to the mechanic, and I pay him the money that I get from doing my specialized job. He's specialized, I'm specialized, everybody is specialized, which means nobody can live on their own. Everybody requires the other specialist to keep them going. And I think, you know, if if people start to focus more internally and think, I need to take care of my own family, I need to be self-sufficient, they're not going to be as as involved. Like you're saying, you could have some sort of balance in between the two extremes, but it is a balance, which means you're not going to be pushing forward on the latest development in artificial intelligence. You know, you're not going to be pushing forward in all of the, the, the cutting, <laughs> yeah, all the cutting edges of, of technology, of, of industry. You'll grow slower. You're not going to be as as advanced, you know, and I think a lot of people, 
want to see society really really advanced and especially the people on the top you know they get to see the monuments and they're the ones orchestrating the 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 construction of the monuments and you don't have monuments when everybody's home taking care of their own stuff you know so um and i think i don't i don't think it's best to have a situation where everybody does only their own stuff you know i think society can be good you want to have it in in a healthy moderation but you know i don't think you want to have such a heavy reliance on it that you're fr- so fragile if if some if if one one aspect of it breaks everybody crumbles you know and that's that's definitely not good but i think you're you're right in saying like by us preparing for an impending doom it could actually make it to where the impending doom doesn't happen you know so right well i mean there was you, you see that um you know when tornado goes through a town that's a prepper town and it's barely even covered on the news you know i saw this a couple of years ago a a town had gotten hit by a really bad tornado. I think it was in Louisiana. I think so. I have to check. But um, I remember they were, you know, they were interviewing people, and um, they're like, "Oh yeah, I had to get down into the into the shelter, and then the power was out. So you know, I had my neighbors come over to my house, and you know, I got solar, and like, well, well, five of us in the neighborhoods got solar, so." You know, I came over to their houses for dinner and we pulled out the, the MREs that we had stored and then got the chainsaws cranked and the kids went, you know, they were mm-hmm. all hanging out in the air conditioner and the men went and cleared the roads. And by the time that the people, the FEMA that, by the time shows FEMA showed up, yeah. all the trees were cleaned up. They were split into firewood. People's yards were cleaned up. Some of the people had already, you know, set the power lines back up on the pole because they were in the way. And... <laughs> You know, and so, and all of a sudden, you know, all the FEMA showed up, they looked around and they left. <laughs> like, yeah. And so I think we don't even think of that being as a bad disaster. It's like, mm-hmm. well, the exact same tornado could have come through, you know, a town that had no preps mm-hmm. and we had been watching it because, oh, somebody, somebody got killed in the tornado because, there was, you know, the houses collapsed and they weren't built well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, all yeah. of these things. People died of exposure the, the next Few right. days and you know didn't have anything to eat so we're choppering you know sending a helicopter with food right mm-hmm. because people don't have three days worth of food on hand right and so things become more of a disaster and because people weren't prepared and it's a sliding scale and once you get enough people ready and prepared like i was being you know a 50 percent is a crazy percentage oh, of yeah. people yeah right that's what i was saying like that's insane but it doesn't take a whole lot might even mm-hmm. be 10%. There is a, but there's a breakover point of there's enough preparation. There's enough resiliency in mm-hmm. the communities that no matter how bad the collapse, if the truck stopped driving, right? Nobody's going to starve. There's a point yeah. at which that happens. And a distribution as well. If you have all the people that are prepared for issues all in one town and that town just, just takes it, you know, flat footed and they're fine and everybody else, you know, can't. The, you, mm-hmm. you you need it to be the right percentage and a proper distribution, you know? Right. But, yeah. But um, I don't know how far we wanted to talk today um, about rebuilding after a collapse or, you know, I, I, I we had mentioned, you know, that before we, we started talking. But, um, yeah, we may want to... Um, we may want to go as far as we can in the, in the more preparing for collapse. And if we... Because I'm feeling like re- rebuilding could be a... A topic on its own you know right. for for a future episode so we may want to okay well i'll stick a little more yeah. with that but if you got some I mean, we can readdress stuff you know it's, it's not yeah. the end of the but world. we can always you know of course we have limited time so yeah. um yeah rebuilding is a, a very complicated and a lot of it is speculation yeah and something we were talking about before we started was um and i think this is uh dan was mentioning this a lot of people do focus very much on the physical preparations of i need to have the weapons. I need to have the 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 food. I need to have the animals. I need to have whatever it is, the medical kits, and those are all true. And the, the, I think the step beyond that is is the the mental stuff of I need to know how to use my stuff. I need to be trained, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, but then it even goes further. I think, and you need to have relational stuff. I need to, I need to have people that I trust, people that are close to me, relatives, friends, church members, people that I know if 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 it comes down to it, you know, we could be shoulder to shoulder, you know, fighting whatever it comes our way and, uh, and we trust each other and that's a necessary, uh, aspect. And, um, 
And one he was mentioning was the, the emotional and spiritual preparation for something. You know, you might see something that's pretty horrific. You might be in a situation where you have to make a very difficult decision and you need to be mentally and emotionally and spiritually prepared for that. You need to know what it is that you believe in so that you don't want to decide what you believe in when you're in that situation. You need to know what are, what are my convictions? What am I going to stand for? And what am I not going to stand for? You, there might be people that say, hey, come run with us. You know, We're going to go do all this stuff, and we think this is the, the best solution. And it might look kind of good. You might think to yourself, maybe I don't want to be with them. You know, Maybe they're not the the doing the right thing. They may be on the, the wrong side of this and I don't I don't want to be involved in that, you know, and that requires discretion and, and all that stuff. And I think people it, it's a little difficult because there's 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 everything that you have to worry about from the little stuff. What's our what's our emergency plan? If something, you know, goes down, where does the where does the wife and kids go? Where does the you know where where do the men meet up? That, that's that sort of stuff. You need to have emergency plans. Um, but then yeah, even into the the bigger things, the deeper things, you know, what <laughs> Am I ready to die? <laughs> am, am I prepared for that? Because I might, you know. I mean, and well, actually, pretty much everybody's guaranteed to it, so it's a good thing to get squared away, you know. Yeah. Now, and um, I don't know if y'all have any any opinion on on the order of those things, or if it, if all of those categories should be progressed, like their own checklist should be progressed simultaneously. You should be at the same time. You're you're getting the stuff. You're learning how to use the stuff, and you're also, you know talking with your your people and, and growing relationships and thinking those deep Speak, thoughts. Speaking of a meeting place, I mean, something happened today. We yeah. wake up tomorrow. There's going to be multiple meetup places stretched throughout. And there's you'll have to have, you know, mm-hmm. personal um, relationships with people of, I trust this guy, you know, my neighbor, my friend, my brother, whatever. Right. But also you're going to have groups that have to have relationships with other groups. Do I trust th- these people? They live uh, a couple counties over. <clears throat> yeah. You know, obviously we're not going to be working with them, you know, constantly, but, you know, under, do we trust them enough to have, to, to cooperate under certain circumstances right. and that sort of thing? You know? Well, that's why you think about, you know, the, the get together that we're going to be going to soon. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that is how you set that up. You have your, you have your family mm-hmm. and then you have your close community and then those communities come together for regional community, mm-hmm. and we meet face to face. We shake hands, say, "What do you believe in?" We get yeah. to know each other. We make contacts, and then we have a, a you know, like, okay, well, we know there are groups over there, and this is how we would get in contact with them. Mm-hmm. But you have to, you you can't rush that. Yeah, it's a it's a you got to build it. Yeah, you got to build it, and it's one of those things where. And really, if you think about it, every every categorical checklist is something that is many small steps, and you can't just make it happen. You yeah. can't just be ready. You know what I mean? You, well, you know. as where we stand right now, what, what do you feel should already be off the checklist? Actually, weapons, ammo, six months supply of well, food. Here's the thing: it's it is what is within your capability. That is that is the It'd only. It'd be nice to be done with the checklist, it'd right? Be, it'd be great. I mean, I think. I mean, if if I had the physical and and um, if you had ec- more time. economic, <laughs> if I had the economic and physical ability to have my checklist finished, then I would big, build a bigger checklist. Gotcha. Right there, because once I'm ready, once let's say let's say me personally, I'm fully prepared. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, then is my family prepared? Okay, my family is prepared. Is my church prepared? Okay, my church is fully prepared. Okay, my local community. Mm -hmm. Are they prepared? Okay, they're fully prepared. Well, move on. Go on to the, go to the meetups and say, okay, what do y'all need? How can I help you get ready? Gotcha. Right? How can I be a benefit? So there's no... There's no ha- what stage right. should you be at. Just it's, keep moving forward. Just keep moving forward. That makes um, sense. And you, but you, ha- you can't <clears throat> do. It's not a sprint because you know. And that you would do it things differently. Yeah. If we know it's collapsing in a week, well then there's, there's certain sh- things you, you're not going to do. If if you got a nine to five job, and you're like, I'm not showing up on Monday because I've got <laughs> stuff to do. But obviously, right. if it's not happening in a week, you you should show up. You should be. Staying established right. so you can buy the things that you need. Indeed. Body armor doesn't buy itself, <clears throat> you know? Right. And if your job is important, I mean, if your job helps society function, All right. 
then, you know, you showing up to your job and doing a good job at your job, Mm -hmm. that is helping prevent the collapse from coming. I mean, you are staving it off another day by doing your job to the best of your ability, being productive in helping society to be a society. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, and that's not nothing. I mean, that's what you want to get back to. I mean, we talk about a collapse and then after the collapse, what are we trying to do? We're trying to get back to where you don't have to be a farmer. Every person be a farmer, Mm -hmm. right? We want division of labor, but we just want enough redundancy and enough local. You want your farmer to be local, you know? Yeah. You say, okay, we want farmers. We, we want 3% of the population, 4% of the population to be farmers. It's like, okay, but we don't want all of them to live in Iowa. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? That's not what yeah. we don't. Iowa secedes from the union. We all starve. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I mean, there's nothing wrong with not having everybody be a farmer. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the thing is that let's say your whole community is prepared. If 3% of your local community are farmers and they're good farmers and they've got 500 acres each, they can feed the whole community. Yeah, that's that's what farming and agriculture and that's that's right. how cities were made is hey, we figured out a really great great way to mass produce food and not everybody has right. to go chase a buffalo. You know? Exactly. And so yeah, and if and if they've they live in the community, you trust them. Mm-hmm. They're not going to stop planting. Now you're set up. You say, "Okay, look, you you've got me on the food, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm going to become a diesel mechanic." That's what I'm going to do. And then, it, and if things get really bad, I'm going to trade diesel mechanic work on your tractors for food because I won't have any money. Mm-hmm. Well, as a farmer, you say, Hey, that's great. I'm not an expert diesel mechanic and I don't have time. I'm a good farmer. Great. I was like, okay, well, long term, you need new tractors. Somebody's like, Hey, I'm going to work in a steel shop. You do need the division of labor, but what we mm-hmm. need to do is not have it to where all of the tractor parts come from China, where yeah. all of the raw materials are mined, you know, in Central in Africa, Central Africa, <laughs> yeah. and then put on a boat, and then put on a boat, and then shipped over here, and then put it on another boat, and then and then we import it all from California <laughs> off of a boat, and then right? one boat gets stuck in the Suez Canal, and the whole world falls <laughs> apart. <laughs> All of a sudden, the farmers can't farm because yeah. of a boat wreck in a canal. Yeah. Like, that's got to be a great example of, of like, that's when you're too fragile. You're too interdependent. You know, you're too, you're too breakable at that point when one guy makes a mistake and wedges his boat in a canal in, in the Sinai Peninsula. Like, yeah. that affects people in Canada and how they can get their, their whatever it is they need. Almost anything that they Every, need. Everything. You know? <laughs> yeah. Because even if you need something like, oh, well, I, I'm, I want blueberries, and we grow blueberries here in Canada, so what's the problem? So, well, yeah, you need the, all the harvester stuff. You need the parts to repair the harvester and all those those sorts of things. And, I mean, even just right. just with with the issue with diesel that we've had over the past, you know, three years, whenever diesel has a problem, everything has a problem. Things don't make it to Walmart when there's no diesel, you know. Right. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's the thing we can do is – is take some of the globalization back, be more self, be more self sufficient, but not at an individual level. Yeah. I don't think that's the long term success. That's that that's like worst case scenario. You don't have any friends, family, nobody you trust, nobody reasonable, right. and you're all alone, and that's scary. And you don't want to have to be in that situation. So right. you're essentially saying do division of labor, do society, but on a, like a smaller level, on a modular level of this town can survive on its own. This town can survive on its own. It's not. I mean, at this point, we can't. States can't even survive on their own. Like right. you're saying, like we have states that make food and states that don't make food. Right. Like, how can you got to make food? <laughs> you know. So yeah, you need food. Yeah, and, and it, it makes it to where you can't have things like the the New York City, uh, you know, metropolitan area, like the, right. the the greater area, including like Newark, New Jersey, New Jersey, and all that kind of stuff. There's like 17 million people. You cannot make food in there. Like it's just. And usually a city like in the ancient times with, with, with Greece and whatnot, they'd have the little city and then they have the agora, the little area around the city, and that would produce all that was needed for that city. So you'd have people that lived out of the city and in rural areas, but they were the people employed for the city to, to grow all yeah. that, the farmers. 
you know, in a, but at this point you can't get an agora for New York city. It's, it's beyond that, you know? So there's certain kinds of society that you just can't have if you're right. doing it in moderation, like we're talking about. We're essentially saying, let's do society in moderation. Let's let's kind of keep some stuff right. localized, and let's all come together and do some big, cool projects here and there. Right, let's do you space know. travel. Yeah. And we, we, you know, it's nice, and we can have specialized locations. You know, it's like, hey, guys, this is a great spot. We're, this is where we're going to la- build and launch the spaceships. You know? It's like, okay, let's do it. And... Mm-hmm. You know, and that, but all the people that are there and working on that project know that my hometown is self-sufficient. Yeah. I mean, and, you let your big but, projects be something that if it doesn't pan out, well, it was worth a shot, but don't let it be your survival. Don't right. let it be like, hey, let's, this is a great idea. Let's just buy all of our food from another country. Like <laughs> that's, right. that's not something you want to do. Yeah. You that, know? That, and, and, you know, by having a modular approach and, um, you just you do stave off if you're if if every town is self sufficient in mm-hmm. and of itself, but still contributes to the the global market, all collapses are going to be regional at most and mm-hmm. quickly recovered from. Yeah. And then so maybe 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 the space race will be a little bit slower because it's not quite as efficient. Mm-hmm. But all you need is one big crash in the you know the high speed market where everything is shipped all over the world and everybody is just a little cog in a in a giant wheel you know mechanism mm-hmm. you know that that only has to suffer one collapse and now the other mar- the other the way of living is will outstrip it and it will never catch. So you're saying tortoise and the hare situation. If you right. go slow and steady in your society you know, developments, you're going to end up surpassing yeah, a, a right. really extreme society that got a lot done real fast, but then, you know, burned out. Yeah. Cause you know, you know, central planning is a brilliant idea if you're, you know, clairvoyant, but you make one mistake and people mm-hmm. starve to death. <clears throat> yeah. then that's, that's been the major issue with communist countries. Right. Is yeah, they'll, they'll plan out their whole economy. The 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 president or the party or whoever's in charge. They're like, we're gonna make this much food, this many bricks, this much steel, all this. You know, telling everybody what to do, and it's not necessarily a bad plan. But you're just you're not gonna get a guy's plan on his desk work for millions of people across millions of acres right. of land. It's things change too quickly. Things don't always pan out. You gotta yeah, you gotta be on the ground, and it's gotta be changing live. You know. And uh, <clears throat> yeah. of course, you got all kinds of issues of you got people lying on reports and stuff. And they said, "Oh yeah, we we manufactured this many tons of steel. We're all good to go. We're on we're on track." Well, great. The the guy at the, guy at the top believes the plan is working, so he's like, "All right, let's make this many tanks." Well, we didn't make that many tanks. Why not? Well, we didn't have enough steel. Of course, we did it. <laughs> the guy said we had enough <laughs> steel, but he just didn't want to get fired. So <laughs> yeah. you know, so you they know. melted down the hammers <laughs> and sent them to us. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you get really, really bad situations when you're so inter- interconnected and so interdependent, you know. And I mean, that that that's a a facet that's anywhere. I mean, you as a person, if you are, if you're totally self reliant and sufficient, you don't have anybody in your life. Well, that's not good. You're gonna you're gonna hit situations where you need friends, you need family, even you know, with, when it comes to emotional stuff, spiritual stuff, financial stuff, whatever. If you don't have a network, that's bad. But also, if you are so networked where you don't really do anything, you're just always somehow being provided for by one aspect of your network, then that's not good, you know. So, I think moderation is a, is a key to all this on the big scale and the small scale. Right. So now, you know, we got to zoom back in to the individual level because mm-hmm. we're way zoomed out. We're on the you know <laughs> global yeah, global society, society level. Yeah. Um, the problem that you know we can't. It's not even a problem. We shouldn't want to, but we can't control other people's decisions. Mm-hmm. And so, if the if the whole town isn't going to become a self sufficient town because people most people don't see the need, well, then you have to become you have to go to the next step and become a, a self sufficient community or family. Yeah, neighborhood, right? whatever. Right. You've got to you got you got to keep getting closer. It's further from the ideal, mm-hmm. but you've got to become more and more conservative. In your planning, mm-hmm. until you can get a nucleus. Okay, it's like okay, this group together as a group can survive. 
Mm -hmm. And I think that's where our planning should be, you know? So if you are alone in a city listening to this and you don't have any friends, you don't have any family, it's you in an apartment and you work nine to five and you watch Netflix and that's your life and you're listening to a podcast right now, the first thing you need to do is become as self-sufficient as an individual as you can and then start building your community. And if you can't do that where you are, you should look into moving. You should look into where can I thrive as a person? Where can I get friends? Where can I be part of a larger whole? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and then if you're already in a town where you have good friends, you have family connections, say, okay, where is there a need? What isn't being done? And what do I have an aptitude for? Mm -hmm. You know, you might not be a great farmer. Not everybody's a great farmer. So like every person doesn't need to own 200 chickens. It's not necessary. Mm -hmm. But find where you are in this cog, (laughs) this machine, you know, where where does your piece fit the best Mm -hmm. and start providing that. And maybe you need to learn new skills to be able to do that. But that's, that's where I think people should be looking, you know, to the biggest, the biggest connection group that they can, that is self-sufficient Yeah, and, and be a productive member of that. I mean, it's almost like a ship. I mean, you want to be on a ship in the middle of the sea as opposed to a little, a little dinghy or a canoe. But if the ship is going down, well, yeah, you want to be on the biggest little boat they have. (laughs) And then if that... (laughs) big one doesn't work, then you want to be on the little canoe because you'd rather be on the canoe than nothing. But if the canoe doesn't work, well, you're grabbing a plank of wood. Right. Like you go with the best you have the, the opportunity to get. And so some communities, the whole town is ready to go. Mm -hmm. And if you're, and some towns are just like that. They've been that that way since 1910. It's been a self-sufficient community and it's in the, their lexicon, you know, it's like, that's how they live. Um, and so it's just instinctive. It's natural. You don't even think about it. You don't even realize it until you think about it. It's like, oh yeah, they, they make the food. They've got, there's a place we can go work on cars. There's a place we could do this. There's, you know, mm-hmm. we're, we are self, like you could, you could put a dome over us, separate us from the world mm-hmm. and we would lose internet and be upset about that. And other than that. So I guess the Amish are moving. pretty much set then. Yeah, well, Amish life wouldn't change that much from, from exactly. what I know. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean they, they're, yeah. It might take them a little while to figure out something happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're not selling so many quilts anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, they might be selling just as many. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> we're all those annoying people taking our picture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, you'll have situations like that. Yeah, it, now, of course personally for myself i don't i don't want to perpetually live in an amish type situation you know me neither but if you're there i mean you're already prepared yes. for for the worst you know so <clears throat> right and, and that's a far that's a i mean that's a that's kind of a maximum on the slider scale mm-hmm. maximum preparedness you know if you're already used to not having electricity well electricity stops being produced big deal who cares yeah. you know it's like oh how are you gonna get parts for your engine don't have an engine mm. huh okay well you know, how are you going to repair your horse and buggy? I made it myself in my garage. Yeah. I it's will like, breed more horses yeah. and build more buggies. Like, well, I don't, I don't have wheel bearings, you know, I've got animal fat grease on a hub. It's like, why? Because I can build that and I can make, raise the animal and then mm-hmm. I can make the grease and I can do everything at my house. It's like, okay, well, yeah, that bearing is not the best bearing, but it is the best bearing that you personally can make. I, th- I think maybe with this kind of goes into is essentially be a part of the biggest chunk of society that you can trust and as far as you trust them you know if you if you trust your your family your church your community then yeah depend on them you know and that's fine be plugged in be involved but if you don't trust your state you don't trust you know that kind of stuff maybe be less involved in those sorts of things and be be ready think think to yourself what happens if if those things leave, if, if the state government leaves and, and organization and all that, you know, be, be ready for that. Obviously, if you live in a, a country where you trust your country, which that would be nice, uh, then I guess. And I, that's probably what happened with America. I mean, we, we've yeah. had a really stable country for a long time. And we've... Is there a country like that these days? I wouldn't say... Uh, it, 
not that I know of. And if there is one, it's probably really small, maybe, and it, it works for it. But I mean, people don't talk about it. I don't know how how stable you know certain countries are, but n- no country on the scale of America is is more stable than America. I wouldn't say, you know. Yeah. So it's and but right now we live in a very global society. I mean, if if in the in, in the nineteen thirties when America went through the Great Depression, Australia, like other side of the world, other hemisphere, it went through a Great Depression too because we're all interconnected, you know. So if if we do fall, you know, there may not be, uh, you know, that's why uh, Dan was talking about um, China and Russia and everything, and and they're trying to be separated that's wise it is you know it's reasonable to to do that if yeah if i was them i would be doing it yeah i mean yeah the 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 ship that's sinking is is the biggest piece of wood but also it's gonna suck you down if you're on top of that ship when you when it goes into the water and you're not gonna swim you know out of that like you do want to get separated and get in a little dinghy if if that's what you got to do you know and yeah I wish I wish Texas would <laughs> do that. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, I, I am for secession. Yeah, I am too. I mean, and um, I don't want to go down with a sinking ship. You know. Yeah, it would be nice to yeah have a bigger bigger boat than just a local community. Mm-hmm. You know, if we could, yeah. if you can, if you can patch up a boat, <laughs> then you know, get it ready and put it mm-hmm. in the water. That's yeah. that's where I'm at. So then, of course, you know, the longer we have, the the more chances we have to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I I do think that there is some level of of modification to the plan based on emergency. Yeah, the plan is the full plan, but depending on how emergent it is, like what you're saying, you cut off the the last things, and and sometimes you cut little details out. I mean, if we we have Jesus talking about, um, you know, in, in the Bible, he's he's given uh, the, the Jews this warning: whenever you see this stuff happen, you know, you need to you need to leave Jerusalem. You need to to run for the hills. Don't don't go get your go bag. Essentially, he said, "Don't get your go bag" because it's that serious. It's that emergent. Like you grab your child and run as fast as you can. You don't go get a change of clothes. You don't go get your knapsack with with a sandwich in it. Hopefully, you'll find something out there to eat. You know, but don't stop for anything. That's obviously extreme emergent. You know, right. that's the apps. You there see, no you see just... the, the, the fireballs, you know, <laughs> and uh, yeah. yeah, you, you don't go home. Run. Yeah. You just yeah. run. Yeah. At that, at that point, you don't really have a list. It's just, right. do I have children that I have to grab? And that's the only thing on your list, you know, and then run right. for it. And so that's, that's really all it is, is, is yeah. how far down the list can I go? Mm-hmm. And yet it, it, there is, there is some level of, obviously if if there isn't impending doom right now it's not a good idea to grab your kid and run for the hills right <laughs> yeah you, you could die out there and if there's <laughs> yeah. no re- need to run don't run you know you could do better yeah don't max out know. all your credit cards and quit your job today because yeah. you heard this podcast and don't drink the kool-aid do not actually right. kool-aid's really bad for you so just don't ever drink kool-aid so. <laughs> yeah never never drink the kool-aid yeah but um but yeah but and, and that's the thing is um you know People people have more time than they think they do. A lot of people. You can cut things. You can cut some things out, you know. And even if all you're doing is learning, mm-hmm. if That's all you're doing thing. is learning how to do something productive, mm-hmm. you know, so that you are a little bit more diversified as a person, you have a little bit more that you can bring to the table. You know, learn learn how to take care of basic injuries. Mm-hmm. You know, H- have basic first aid kids mm-hmm. you know start small and and push yourself a little bit you know do things right. like well i don't work on my car okay well, well don't rebuild your engine but maybe learn to change your oil <laughs> you know yeah. learn to change your spark plugs you know learn to push yourself in in, yeah. in different things and and you can see where you excel and just having yeah basic knowledge and understanding of of things that you don't really have to learn in our society you could right. just bring it to somebody else and they'd do it you know but yeah to but push yourself on you won't things. regret it if you know how to change the oil on your car mm-hmm. you know um we've had one vehicle that totally died in you know in my household um and it was after an oil change my wife before she was my wife went to a oil change place did not know how to check her own oil didn't know how family mm-hmm. doesn't know how she didn't know how went to the place got the oil changed drove home they didn't tighten the oil drain plug on the way home all the oil drained out on the highway engine seized 
mm-hmm. catastrophic engine failure because yeah. she didn't know how to change her own oil mm-hmm. and you know, things like that, you know, you're not going to regret at least knowing how to do it. Yeah. Even if all you do is learn how to do it and then go pay somebody. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Would it I, not I, be I, knocking on the way home? She didn't know. She just thought it was. She didn't know anybody about cars. No knowledge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's crazy. Well, I mean, I know people that drove around with the oil light on in their vehicle. With the what? Oil light on, telling them that there's no oil. Just keep driving. Imagine. Just didn't know any better. Didn't ask. And well, we had a friend. <clears throat> he got a lawsuit. He got $5,000. And he bought a Bonneville. This is years ago. I just got out of high school. Bought a what? A Bonneville. Is that, what is that? Is That's that a, a car. Okay. So yeah, anyway, <clears throat> and um, I guess it was it's a uh, Chevy. 84, 85. I, her name was, what was her name? Anyway, she makes it to the house and she goes, man, it kept dying this and that. I said, what's the deal? She goes, oh, it's overheating. I was just steadily, I, I steadily cranking. And she goes, I finally made it. She goes, oh, I kept cranking it, cranking it. Sure enough, she burned it up, but just bought it. You know, I mean, just, yeah. she didn't know no better. Right, let it cool off. She until it cranked again. Yeah, I mean, it, and things aren't. Some things are intuitive, but not everything is intuitive about stuff, you know. And um, and if yeah, if you don't have the basic knowledge and understanding, you could really mess yourself up, you know. She burnt and, it uh, up. Yeah, yeah. You can spend. So that's what I'm saying is, by diversifying yourself in these certain ways, mm-hmm. you're never you're not going to regret it, even if nothing ever collapses. All right. Yeah. Nice to know. It, you know, you, how much money will you save yourself? How much headache will you save yourself? You know. Yeah. Ha- Will you be able to help other people? Somebody is on the side of the road and you have learned some basic mechanical ability. Mm -hmm. And there's an old lady and she's on the side of the road and you drive up and you say, what's wrong? And she says, well, my oil light came on. I knew I was a little bit low. I've got five quarts of oil in the trunk. Could you help me? If you don't know how to put oil in a car, Mm -hmm. you could do more damage by trying to help Mm -hmm. than if you just didn't help. Mm Mm-hmm. But if you do know and you're competent, you could say, absolutely. Now, this is something that's happened to me. So, you know, I'm using this as an example. Um, and, you know, the lady didn't have the strength to open the oil cap. So it wasn't a lack of knowledge. It was a lack of ability. Mm-hmm. And so opened it up, checked the oil. It was definitely low. She had the proper oil in the vehicle. Just couldn't put it in. Put the oil in, got it all checked up, ready to go. She drove off happy and just basic knowledge mm-hmm. can help not just yourself but the people around you yeah i mean you you probably would regret <clears throat> going fully amish and then nothing ever happens and you're like well i just no. totally up changed my <clears throat> right. whole life you know that's extreme but yeah you're probably not gonna regret regret well I, I didn't get to you know finish all the the episodes of whatever it is that i that i've been watching i've been binging recently but at least i can do this for the rest of my life you know that's kind of nice <laughs> you know right. so it's a good return on investment you know on, on that sort of thing and um but i think probably the most most important thing i think for people to work on when when they know it's not complete emergency where you just you just run you know run for the hills kind of thing is to to start to think critically and start to think even uncomfortably things that you don't like to think about, you know, what would I do in this situation? Or maybe I should start changing aspects of my life right now, you know, spending time doing stuff that I don't know how to do that sort of thing. Um, and deciding yeah, what you believe in, that's really a, a, an important thing, you know, cause if you don't have strong convictions and you don't know where you stand, I mean, in a way, it's kind of like the rest of it's a little bit wasted, you know, <laughs> like you really need to know those, those, those basic core things. So yeah, I feel like, and have, having a lot now, all of it, I think should be done to some degree simultaneously. You should be doing a little bit of everything at once. You should be, you know, dealing with emotional stuff, dealing with, uh, learning new skills, dealing with buying ammunition, you know, when you see it on, on sale or whatever, you know, and, but yeah, I think I think there's a, a priority list. But I think you're right about like there is just one big list, and you do as much as you can get done, you know, and and hopefully that suffices, right? You know? Yeah, and yeah, the the further you get down the list, man, you, you do things like, hey, what's the next step? It's like, okay, well, society's fantastic, everything's great, mm-hmm. everybody's taken care of, we've solved world hunger. <laughs> it's like, you know, let's just say for the sake of argument, yeah. you know. The preppers have prepped, right? All the way through. We have great leadership. If we don't, we get rid of them. 
And now what do we do? It's like, well, let's become multi-planetary. That's the next prep. What if, the, what if we get hit with an asteroid? Mm-hmm. Right. We got all our eggs in one basket. We got all our eggs in one basket. You know, that's what Elon Musk is working on. He's like, that's what I'm, that, he's like, that's yeah. where I'm going to fit in the machine. Right. It's like, okay, great. You know, but uh, I mean, seriously, why would you not do that? I mean, scripture doesn't say you can't be multi-planetary. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the, the planet is not going to be destroyed accidentally when oh, it's yeah. not supposed to be. But why so. not? But why not go do some other stuff too? I mean, when it's, why not? When it's cool and fun, you know? Yeah. I know, I know Mark loves, loves interplanetary, planetary travel. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's really important, right, Mark? It's really necessary. I'm just <laughs> tell us how you really feel, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> it's past his bedtime. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I can see it in his eyes. We're recording well, this really late at night. Well, it's power nap time. Yeah. Oh. And when it hits, it hits. Mm-hmm. And it could be at any time. Yes, it, 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 yeah, really when it hits. I'm just, feeling it too. I'm it's tired of on yeah. this uh I got up at three as usual and <laughs> Yep. Yeah, well, so, I, 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 yeah, I just did. don't know when it comes, but when it comes yeah, but I do have one more thing to, to touch on real quick. Yeah. Um, and it's on the, the mindset thing and the mental, um, by doing the prepping, you are working on your mental. It yeah. comes about learning, learning how to deal with livestock, you know, yeah. learning how to deal. Like my wife had to kill something for the first time in her life mm-hmm. the other day. And she didn't realize that it happened. Um, there was a snake that ate a baby rabbit or breeding rabbits. And there's always been someone else to kill something. There's always, there's never been, she's always felt bad for the thing mm-hmm. and just, just can't do it. Just can't do it. Yeah. I just, and she told me like two months ago, I just don't think I'll ever be able to kill anything other than a bug. I don't think I'll be able to. It's beyond my capacity. And I was like, I understand that. You know, some people can't. Mm-hmm. And um, well, the snake broke in and ate one of her baby rabbits. That's That'll really cute. It. That'll push you over the edge. And fluffy. <laughs> and there's a bulge in it with that. There's a baby rabbit inside. Mm-hmm. And she killed it. Did she save the rabbit? Tried. Tried to cut it out, but it is too late. Right. Yeah. But of course, I mean, there is that that aspect to it. You know, if it had just swallowed it and you could save the rabbit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But she did kill the snake. But she killed the snake. And um, and didn't realize that that was the first time she had done it. She was still amped up on what had happened. She was telling me what happened. And I said, you killed the thing for the first time. And she's like, what? I was like, you killed an animal for the first time. That was it. She's like, oh, oh, yeah. That was the first time I did it. Mm-hmm. Like, well, wh- why was she in that position? Because she's raising rabbits. Yeah. And, you're, and when right. you're pushing yourself, you are becoming tougher, you know, mentally, you're out of your right. comfort zone. You're, you're, <clears throat> you're used to thinking a little bit more critically about stuff. Yep. And you're a little bit less emotional in your decisions, you know. So right. when you're in a situation like, well, I have to kill it or it'll, it'll eat more. You know, I'm going to lose more of these rabbits. And I've, I've been working on these things for a while. So I don't want right. to lose where I'm at, you know. And um, it, it, you, you just see it as the, the the reasonable and rational thing. And you're already used to being outside of your comfort zone. So what's one more step, you know, and you right. do that. So. And so, yeah. And now she went from I could never kill anything to I could kill something if it's necessary. Mm-hmm. And you usually don't go backwards. Right. She could kill another snake if she had to. And right. she could probably kill another predator, a small predator that's that's messing with her right. animals. She's working her way up. She'll right. be at humans in no time. Yeah, he's man, <laughs> brother. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, I, yeah. I mean, and, but, and that, but that's, that's what I'm saying is, you know, by, by expanding what you know, by mm-hmm. expanding what you do, you'll find yourself doing things that you might have thought were out of your capability. That and that you, th- you weren't aiming for. Right. Yeah. She wa- she had no desire to kill anything, obviously. Mm-hmm. And she, you know, super sweet. And she didn't want to kill that snake. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, in that situation, you're like, okay, it's still in the it's still in there. And it's just trying to digest this rabbit so it can eat another rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> right? That won't happen. You know, there there's, yeah. a, there's a point where you're just like, you know, something just needs to die. You know? <laughs> Can I ask how she killed it? With a shovel, I believe, chopped its head off, mm. and um, Brutal. but you know, and and some sometimes you just need the clear thing. Where it's like, well, you know, your empathy. It's like, okay, well, where are you going to engage your empathy? It's like, oh, I don't want to kill anything. It's actively killing the things that you like. That'll it's change like, stuff. Yeah. Okay, well, you know what? <laughs> you you are literally preventing death mm-hmm. by doing the the killing. You know, it changes the way you think, mm-hmm. and it's it's all and it's all you know, an intellectual exercise Yeah. until it's eating your rabbit. 
<laughs> and that's your rabbit that you were petting and hugging yesterday. Yeah. And now you wake up and it's dead being digested. And you're like, you know what? <laughs> I thought I couldn't kill you, but I can now. Right. And that's the same thing with self-defense. You know, like I, I thought I could never pull the trigger. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, well, my babies were in danger. Well, things changed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The way I thought changed, you know? Yeah. And I think to a degree, just, I guess one one last little point um, is is when you're in a situation the the environment can change you a bit, you know, like it is awfully hard to prepare for a disaster when you do not believe that a disaster is coming. Why would you? And you just don't. But when you believe that there's impending doom, you don't feel like a crazy person when you're grabbing your go bag and flooring it whenever there's something that requires that. Any other day of the week, you're you're an idiot. You're you're a weirdo. You know right. why? Why is this person speeding at 110 miles per hour with their go bag? You know. <laughs> It, there better be a reason for it, you know? Right. But yeah, when when there is an environmental reason for something, it's it, yeah, it becomes justified and you'll do things that you didn't think that you would do, you know? Right. Which is why you want to have those convictions set in so that you don't find yourself doing things that, that you, you didn't think that you would do, but now you kind of think, maybe I shouldn't have done, you know? Right. It seemed like it was reasonable at the time, but I don't know if I should have done that, you know? So yeah. you definitely you want to know think, where you stand. Yeah, think think through all those things before you make a decision. Yeah. That's exactly right. I think, I think in future episodes, um, not necessarily the next one but in future episodes we'll we'll go more into detail when it comes to like the nitty-gritty of things like communications ham radio when it comes to med kits when it, you know israeli bandages that kind of stuff whatever right. we want to go into we can go deep right. into the today was a of, big, big of details picture. yeah there's, there's a big picture and we can always readdress it and i'm sure these are recurring topics that are, you know we're going we're to talk about oh, again yeah. and everything but i think it was a good discussion and it's a it's a good thing for people to be in the mindset of I have to decide for myself, what am I going to prepare for? What do I think is going to happen and be responsible for yourself? No matter where you are or how prepared you already happen to be, I mean, you should be responsible and know where you stand. And if you're like, I'm not going to go past this certain line for whatever reason, you should have a good reason for it. You know what I mean? You should, you should, you should know where you stand. So yeah. And, and don't footsteps of Jesus. (laughs) That's right. What? (laughs) The footsteps of Jesus. That's where he stands. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was following, but uh, yeah, it's it's yeah. written on the book. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I, I was just waiting for yeah. whack authority. Yeah, but um, and you know that, and that's the that's the other thing is just want to you know put it out there. You know, as we're wrapping this up for people listening, is just to think you don't have to move and become Amish. That's it's not a binary decision. Yeah. It, I was just saying, oh, yeah. they're ready that did have. No, oh, yeah, I'm not yeah, becoming yeah. Amish. Yeah, yeah, I know. No, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. just, I just want, because yeah. a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to become a prepper. I don't want to be a crazy person, right? Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. And um, and that prevents them from getting ready in any way. It's yeah. like, you don't have to do that. Just, you know, maybe you don't think anything bad's going to happen. Okay, well, learning some skills, though, mm-hmm. will, even if no collapse happened, even if nothing bad happens, I mean, we're always going to have hurricanes. We're always going to have tornadoes. Mm -hmm. We'll always have, you know, all sorts of natural disasters. And maybe every, all the politicians make great decisions and maybe, you know, okay, well, but if you're ready, Mm -hmm. if, if you have become more self-sufficient, if you are more engaged in your community, it can only help. Yeah. It's not going to be a negative. Yeah, they, they could, there's there's always going to be various things. I mean, just earlier today, I was I was dealing with my nephew that got his his hand sliced wide open. He's uh, one, well, almost two, and super. It was super sad. He's a cute, good kid, and everything, and and he was in a lot of pain. We had to go to the ER and stuff. But like, you know, making trying to deal with that sort of situation. Now, thankfully, it wasn't arterial or anything like that. There wasn't. There was no like immediate first day aside from washing it determining hey this is deep enough we got to go to the er and get it stitched up but the, you know there wasn't anything like that but there's no reason that that can't just happen to anybody you know you could you could live in essentially paradise and your kid oh. gets hurt you know what if your kid what if it did hit his artery you know well i've never used a tourniquet but i know the concept of it and i have multiple tourniquets you know i could go and run and grab one and apply it now that's something that i wouldn't have been able to do you know a number of years ago now even still of course i have no experience so i may make mistakes i don't know exactly how tight to put a tourniquet on a little kid you know i know <laughs> know to use the, the the smaller one the rat tourniquet instead of the cat tourniquet and so i know certain some things you know but like knowing some is always going to help you knowing a little bit more is going to help you, you know, so you don't, it doesn't have to, if you don't believe the world's, you know, collapsing and all that sort of stuff. I mean, 
knowing how to deal with your your kid when they get all bloodied up that's that's helpful you know absolutely and you know car accident yeah yeah just having that first aid knowledge Mm -hmm. you could save somebody's life having the ability to, to defend yourself if you're you know you're in a bank and the bank robber comes in or there's a hostage situation you don't never you don't know what kind of situation you might find yourself in maybe it's not society collapsing but it's just your immediate surroundings being your, dangerous, yeah so. your immediate situation yeah yeah collapsing so well yep. I, th- I think that was uh that was that was good i enjoyed the discussion and everything and i appreciate all of y'all and y'all's uh input so um yeah we'll uh we'll leave it at that and uh we hope y'all have a fantastic day and uh hope that you're responsible and and Hope that you know God, because if you die, what does it all matter? If you're prepared, everybody's going to die. And so you got to get ready to see your maker. So, Amen. Uh, Amen. Yeah, well, peace out, guys, and, uh, and y'all have fun. Bye. Bye.